Hello and welcome to this seventh edition of Vic Forum 2022, produced by Polaron Language Services and proudly sponsored by NATI. Now, we don't have a crystal ball, but today we are going to look into the future of the language services industry. There's a lot of exciting things going on and I'm Michael Loder. I'll be your host for today, but first a special guest to welcome us to this event. Now, Auntie Diane Summers is an elder of the Bunurong and sits on the board of directors as the female elder. It's my pleasure to introduce Auntie Diane with Eva Hussein, Director of Polaron Language Services, to provide us with a welcome to country. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Wominjika Oriolul Wuntalong, Bunurong. That's me saying hello and welcome to my beautiful Bunurong country. I respectfully acknowledge my elders past, present, and those blossoming to become elders. I'd like to acknowledge my apical grandmother, Nanda Gorok, who was given the name Elizabeth Maynard, but lovingly called by her family, Granny Betty. My grandmother's story is a story that's yet to be fully told. Nanda Gorok was the wife of Deremit, and he was the chief of the Southeast Kulin Nation, the Bunurong chief. He was a highly respected chief. My grandmother was kidnapped on the 3rd of January, 1837 by a sealer by the name of George Meredith. When she was kidnapped, she was ready to birth her first child. She was kidnapped from her homeland at Point Nepean and taken to the Bastrade Islands. There she was sold and forced into another marriage with another sealer by the name of Richard Maynard a somewhat slaved and loveless marriage. But today that gives me strength and hope. They went on to have a large family of Bunurong children. From my grandmother on this small remote island on Cape Barren Island, a Bunurong community was born. They lived there. They shared cultural knowledge, stories, and some language even survived. They worked hard, they thrived and the community grew. Now Flinders and Cape Barren Islands in the Bass Strait have a large population of Bunurong descendants. Up to 80% of the First Nation people living on these two islands have direct Bunurong bloodlines. These beautiful windswept islands are where I grew up. I spent 50% of my year of the year on Flinders Island and the other 50% here on the Mornington Peninsula. My name is Diane Summers. I'm a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. I'm a sister and aunt. I'm a nana. I'm an educator. I'm a keeper of culture and a friend to many. I'm a weaver. I'm a shell st stringer and I'm a storyteller. In closing, I ask you all to please tread lightly on this land as this land holds all of the spiritual stories of my grandmother. Their spirits are forever held within this land. Banjul blessings, Wamanjika, thank you all. Very well done, well spoken, Hannah. Thank you so much. Some beautiful words there. I would also like to acknowledge that this segment is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people. I pay my respects to elders both past, present and future and I'd like to welcome our live audience out there here at Ticker Park and of course everyone watching online. We're streaming this live out there to the world. Now we also received a message from the Honourable Ross Spence, Victoria's Minister for Multicultural Affairs. In the role since 2020, she has been a vocal advocate for Victoria's multicultural communities, committed to removing the barriers that they face. In addition, Ms Spence is the Minister for Community Sport and Youth as well. Here's what she had to share with today's forum. Thank you for inviting me to address today's forum. I'd like to take this opportunity to again congratulate Eva Hussain for her dedication to language services, reflected in her recognition in last year's Victorian Multicultural Commission Refugee Awards. This year's forum theme 
provides an opportunity to reflect on how we communicate to different audiences, particularly in light of what we've learnt over the past two years. I've been inspired by the resilience and leadership of our multi-faith and multicultural communities who've partnered with us to share resources and to deliver fast, culturally and linguistically appropriate communications. One example of this collaboration is the Multilingual News Service, launched by the National Ethnic and Multicultural Broadcasters Council in 2020. This service continues to provide important and timely COVID-19 information in 19 languages, distributing around 80 news broadcasts a week across 15 community radio stations, reaching about 300,000 multicultural listeners every day. Our Multicultural Communications Outreach Program, which has so far supported 78 media outlets, individuals and organisations, has been fundamental in delivering tailored communications. And a second round of the program is currently open for applications. We're now translating vital information into more than 57 languages and using new ways to reach out to vulnerable communities. These collaborations mean that today, Victorians have a lot to look forward to. We're finally returning to regular in-person events and gatherings after two years of online meetings and stop-start in-person engagements. And with this, our language services industry will no doubt experience further change. And I'm confident that the sector will continue to adapt to provide quality communication services for all Victorians. Best wishes for the forum and have a wonderful cultural diversity week. A kind message there from the Honourable Ross Spence, uh, who was, of course is the Minister for Multicultural Affairs Victoria. Big hello to everyone out there in television land, streaming live. And now let's listen to Mr Craig Ondaatje, the Shadow Minister for Multicultural Affairs Victoria, who provided us with a message for today's forum as well. Haba. Guten Tag. Salam Alaikum. Namaste. Ayabowan. Suaste. Ni hao, bula, bonjour, bonasera, konnichiwa, yasas, salama patang, zdravo, ki ora, how's it, jambo, sin chao, hello, g'day. It's nice to be with you today, unfortunately not in person at Vic Forum 2022. I would much rather have been there with you today, but Parliament has kept me away from you today. It's nice to be together again. I'm getting a bit tired of uh, having meetings over the last two years where the first words yelled at me are, you're on mute. So I'm hopefully not on mute with you today. Thank you for being part of this very important forum today as you talk about communication and how we talk with people rather than just to them. I'd like to see today ways that we can improve our levels of communication between each other, not just by Zoom meetings or Teams meetings. That's why foreign language services are so important to us. With our vast multicultural community right across Australia, the beauty, the diversity of our multicultural, multi-faith communities are so important to us. So I wish you well today in your discussions. I ask you to come up with some positive outcomes, some strong outcomes. If you've got an idea, please put them forward because we want to hear about them. Thank you for being part of Vic Forum 2022 today. I wish you many blessings from my family to you. Let's build a stronger nation. Have a great day. Hello and welcome back. I'm your host, Mike Loder. Now we are here in the studio with Aaron Hupka, CEO of Polaron Language Services. 
and Victorian Multicultural Commission Chairperson Vivian Nguyen. We also have Mark Painting in the studio. He is the CEO of the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters. Nati is, of course, the generous key sponsor of Vic Forum 2022. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Now, Thank you. Aaron, we're back in the studio, thank goodness, after a strange few years of COVID. <laughs> um, and this is the seventh edition of Polaron's very successful uh, Vic Forum, Diversity Forum, I should say. So it's a joint effort by people and organisations who care about how we communicate, you know, that's very clear. But I wanted to ask how the forum is different this year. I mean, last time I saw you, it was a very different landscape. Yes, agreed. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having us here. No worries. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, as you said, this is our seventh iteration of the forum, which is fantastic. And the growth over that first forum to now mm. uh, has been significant. Our first forum had 100... Uh, registered attendees, now we've got uh, close to 700 this year. So fantastic growth. Um, this year's forum is uh, based around uh, uh, technology, multicultural communities and uh, language services. Um, so we're hoping to have uh, a spirited debate. The, uh, the, the panel is, uh, is about uh, Beyond Translations um, and uh, how it's looking at the language services industry as a whole. Um, and our debate piece is on whether technology will be the, uh, the downfall of humanity. It's an interesting one, that's for sure. Absolutely. There's a lot of facets to, you know, we've seen things like Google Translate pop up and all sorts of things. Some are helpful, some are less helpful. It's interesting to see, but... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Vivian, I'll go to you. And uh, you've had a couple of busy years at VMC, I understand, and it seems to be an understatement from what I've read. Um, improving access to language services for multicultural Victorians is an ongoing journey as we've seen, especially through the pandemic. Um, what has VMC been doing recently in this space? Can you share some exciting updates for us? Well, the last two years has been busy and in many different ways for everybody. For us in recent uh, days, we've been marking Cultural Diversity Week. On Monday, mm -hmm. as you know, Mike, we mark the International Day or United Nations International Day of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And the Cultural Diversity Week for us is largely about uh, celebrating the strength of multicultural communities, but also putting the spotlight on the issues and the challenges and access to services, whether it be through lack of languages, uh, interpreting or other forms of engagement has been a significant challenge for us as we have seen and I believe that does need to change and to improve in addition to translations but also other ways in which we engage the communities. Yeah and it's uh, of course having the Vic Forum is a way to sort of bring Indeed. these issues to light and, and, and have that discussion further the discussion I suppose and Mark today's event uh, as Aaron mentioned focuses on technology and languages and how communities can benefit from it um, can you help explain why it's so integral that we're discussing this today, just going off what Aaron and Vivian both sort of said? Yeah, sure. And thanks, Mike. And I think like technology in all aspects of uh, the world economy is progressing rapidly. It's certainly the case in language services. Um, the thing about the, tech, the technology wave is that it will happen irrespective. So mm. whether we like it or not, it will still happen. Whether we plan for it or not, it will still happen. Um, so one of the things that people are most concerned about or what they're feared about is often the unknown. So and the, the wave of technology coming in this sector is largely the same thing. It's the unknown about what that will mean or what, what, that will, you know, what, what the implications of that for people. And of course, the first, the first step in addressing the unknown is to understand better. Mm. And the important first step in understanding is to discuss it. So I think by uh, having an open mind and embracing it and trying to uh, discuss it and a, a great place to have that discussion, of course, is, is here at the Vic Forum. So I think a question for me, and I'll ask each of you, is what are you hoping that the audience takes away from today's discussion? Aaron, I'll start with you. And I suppose we're going to be looking at some of the challenges. We're going to be unpacking some of the successes. But what I guess is the key point and what would you feel happy walking away with after today's Vic Forum? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think further to um, uh, what the comments were uh, earlier um, uh, about talking about technology and, and, and how it's going to change uh, and, and really help support uh, the language services and interpreting uh, space overall. Um, so I think having an open and frank conversation about what those technology pieces look like um, and how they will help support those industries is, um, is, is key to today's event. Yeah, yeah. Mark? 
Yeah, I think what's important to people to leave um, more stimulated and more willing to think about it and even ask more questions. Uh, we won't be solved today, but it's, uh, I guess, getting more comfortable, more understanding uh, and to seek, to seek more. Yeah, Vivian, over to you. You know, some of the, the issues that I deal with are with the, mo you know, for the people who have some of the most significant barriers. So for me, it is about making sure that the whatever the technology and, and the services are, that they need to be available to people and making it available to people that, that to whom the services are for uh, need to be seen from their perspective and which means that we do need to understand the challenges they experience and delivering it in their way and coming to them as opposed to expecting them to come to us to re be able to receive the services. So that deep engagement to me is really, really important. Mm. No, it was interesting. We saw some uh, interesting uh, barriers pop up during the pandemic. There was obviously communication, there was lockdowns, there was text, that, you know, PCR and all this sort of thing. What have been some of the challenges or barriers that you've seen now that things are opening up again? And I understand it creates a whole new sort of environment. Is there anything that stands out for any of you? But Vivian, I'll yeah. start with you. There are, and, and I think the fast-moving nature of this pandemic and the, uh, the changing decision-making processes that are made by various uh, bodies um, are, are too fast for people to be able to keep pace with what's going on. And I think, you know, to be able to make sure that that pace, that, that, that information is con continually provided to people in a way that they, they can understand and be kept up to date so that they can too follow the public orders, I think is really important. Mm. And that hasn't always happened. Yeah, Mark, what have you seen in the space in terms of coming out of lockdown and understanding what uh, changes, that rapid change that we've been seeing? Yeah, well, for us, um, in, in terms of managing the certification system, our ability to uh, deliver the testing for that, of course, we had to rapidly pivot to an online environment. And, and now we're starting to be able to uh, work in hybrid type capacities. And so there's still a lot of um, people coming to grips with one or the other and, and preferences and things are moving yeah. really quickly. So both from our staff point of view, but also the many people uh, we, we support uh, in, 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 I guess, in just being comfortable with all of that change. Yeah, and there are those words, pivot mm. and hybrid. <laughs> Aaron, how have you seen this rapid pace change after all of this sort of nonsense has gone on and in relation to the work you guys get up to at Polaron, I suppose? Yeah, look, we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to, um, as you mentioned that word, uh, pivot quite quickly <laughs> during the pandemic and support, you know, both government and, uh, uh, and NGOs mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with COVID-related translation uh, information. And we want to continue to do that um, with a lot of the uncertainty with, uh, with where some of the government regulations are at, at this stage. So we want to continue to support those organisations as best we can. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining me on the program today and uh, sharing your insight. And I look forward to an exciting year ahead and uh, as we continue the Vic Forum. Now to our keynote speaker for today. And Canva is one of Australia's most inspirational success stories. Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone I know uses Canva for graphic design, including myself, and that's the truth. It was, of course, exciting to have Rachel Carruthers with us to tell us all about Canva's journey and the future of translation and localization when it comes to creativity and connectivity. Let's take a listen. We continue our programming with Canva, an Australian graphic design platform which is one of Australia's most successful tech companies. Canva's head of internationalization and localization, Rachel Carruthers, is a remarkable member of the Canva team, creating new opportunities for growth and paving the way for region-specific content. Rachel joins me alongside Director of Polaron Language Services, Eva Hussein. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for your time. Hello, Nai. Thank you for having us. Rachel, first up, I want to talk about, well, I love Canva. I think I mentioned that to you <laughs> off air, so well done. But let's talk Thank a little you. bit about some of the growth areas in this space when it comes to global reach and localization and why these tools should be available for everyone. Yeah, well, thank you again so much for having me, Mark, and it's nice to be here with you here as well. Um, so, so much of what we do at Canva is really this ethos of democratizing design. And as we were just discussing earlier, making design accessible. And it's, you know, the actual tooling itself, you know, the, the, the kind of digital literacy that we're trying to help people improve and, and just again make you know the act of designing quite accessible and easy. Um, but also the concept of design too. You know, I think in some uh, different countries and some different cultures there's kind of this really 
uh, sense that design has to be this very elevated highbrow thing, right? When it, it doesn't, it can, well, it can, it can be anything. And so within the localization space, you know, again, it's really uh, our, our role and our goal within Canva is to make sure that as many people can, can have access to this tool, no matter where they are, no matter what language they speak, and make sure that they can express their creativity in a way that feels uh, intuitive and, and local to them. Yeah, and as a Photoshop snob, I must say that I took to Canva quite quickly. <laughs> it was very exciting to see something so intuitive. But um, why, given that English is the most widely spoken language around the world, should brands consider localization, um, I suppose, as like an essential part and not just sort of a sideline? Yeah. That's a, it's a great question. You know, while English is one of the most widely spoken languages in the world, the language of the internet is different, you know. Mm. Um, yes, of course, there's billions of people using English on the internet. Um, but languages like Spanish and um, Hindi and even Russian and, of course, Chinese follow very, very closely. And so you are really, um, you know, running the risk of perhaps isolating or alienating users that you might be able to otherwise reach if you localize your product well. Um, you know, there are other markets where English literacy rate is also incredibly low. I think something in Brazil, it's something like only about 5% of people right. speak English natively or fluently. And so, you know, Brazil is a massive market in terms of product growth and business growth. If you're overlooking, you know, these types of demographics, you're missing out on a huge part of the market. Yeah, and that's the thing, isn't it? Missing out. But what is the role of localization strategy, I suppose, in shaping successful digital education? Um, mm. environments. So I suppose that's another important one when it comes to getting people through the door and starting their journey. Absolutely. So um, over the, I mean, especially in the last few years with, you know, COVID, COVID has just changed the mm. landscape for so many different um, industries and, and, you know, education is one of them. But uh, increasingly so, governments are really investing in digital infrastructure, things like having tablets in the classroom, making sure that kids have access to computers, especially um, in a remote setting environment or especially in now you know, what were traditionally more rural areas, um, they, especially in Latin America, they're, they're really kind of doubling down and, and making sure that these classrooms are connected. And so a platform like Canva uh, really helps facilitate that uh, kind of remote working and collaboration um, between teachers and their students, no matter where they are in the world. And it's fun to use. And just it's fun quietly. to use. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Canva's obviously been successful in localizing content, um, making it accessible as we've discussed. But what lessons do you think other brands could learn um, from your meteoric rise when it comes to globalization and, and creating multilingual content. Um, right. What lessons would you give out? What tips and tricks might you give to the other brands out there looking to catch up? I mean, I would say that be con first off, be conscious of your own biases, you know, uh, as individuals yep. and as companies. And it, it might be the first natural step to say, we have all of this content that we want to localize. You know, we'll take this English content, this global content, and just translate it into those other languages, and that will be fine. That can be a step, but you need to consider what hyper-localization requirements might exist as well. If we're taking the classroom education example, curriculums are going to look different from classroom to classroom, from country to country. And it's not always going to be enough to just take what you have in English and translate that. You might actually have to develop, you know, localized cur curriculum content that is specific for that market too. So just kind of check your own biases and make sure that what you think needs to be done, or I guess kind of have a sanity check about what you think needs to be done for a market and then, you know, what what people are saying on the ground, listen to your users and understand what their needs are. Okay, so you've made some really interesting points there, but I wanted to go to Eva now when we were talking about machine learning in relation to humanity, I suppose, on the whole, which is a bit of a theme of the forum. Eva, what's your experience been um, when using or trying to communicate with graphic design? I understand Polaron does a bit of this work in order to translate and communicate during the pandemic. Um, you guys had all sorts of pamphlets and brochures and you were helping people get care. Mm -hmm. um, talk about your experience, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Mike. So when I first started the company in 2000, my entire office uh, did what my phone does today. So think about that. <laughs> and, um, you know, as far as technology goes, I see it as a um, support mechanism to human existence. So I would hate um, to live at, you know, in, in a time where humans um, don't um, have a say. Mm. Um, but I think it's very important to be ahead of these trends and, um, and also uh, understand how te technology can support what we do. Um, you know, Canva does um, uh, translations in a hundred languages so from Africans to Zulu. Wow. So you can imagine what a massive um, effort that is. So without technology, they, they couldn't do what they do. 
and you know you do need to make things more accessible because um, humans can't cope with the amount of information that's coming at us from all different quarters so I think you know when I first started we had clip art um, I don't know if anyone <laughs> remembers that so it's so pleasing to see how far we've got we, we've uh, progressed um, and I think um, technology is there to stay but it mm. needs to be used in a way that supports humanity not the other way around so there's always that danger of um, you know entering territories that are a bit grey. Um, but look, we always look at new technologies and how they can support what our translators do. Um, and, you know, it's a sky's the limit, um, as Rachel said earlier. Um, there's lots of um, things we could be doing. The question is which ones, because you can't, you know, do everything. Um, yeah. But I guess when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence and any type of technology that assists humans, that's the area that I'm mostly interested in. Yeah. yeah, no, I remember growing up, I was very excited by AI and machine learning and all this sort of stuff. And now you get older, you start to realize we're heading a little bit more towards maybe the scariest stories that uh, we mm. see in the films. And Rachel, do you agree with what uh, Eva's outlined here in terms of the, the human element? that we may lose. Absolutely, absolutely. And when it, comes, when it comes to something like design, it can be so deeply personal as well. And so, you know, when we're looking at the content that we're like localizing what we do, you always need to have, no matter what translation process we're looking at, we always want to have, you know, the human element, the human review, because there are things that, you know, also machine learning can always catch. Like, you know, don't use this color combination, this template, because it's quite touchy for, you know, X market. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that you need to, there's a lot of nuance there um, in design that needs to be represented as well. Well, just continuing on from that, uh, I understand you guys have a new template localization process uh, going on within Canva. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what that entails? It sounds uh, out of my depth. Tell me a bit more. <laughs> it, um, yeah, it took us a while to get there. Um, but actually, you know, again, leaning on what Eva has said, it's kind of this hybrid model of leaning on um, machine translation and also getting humans involved as well. So we start essentially with a, an English template that we um, extract an XML from. And we actually, instead of just translating that XML in a traditional way, we actually send it to a vendor of ours who does um, neural machine translation. So it's um, essentially kind of like predictive, um, predictive, text. Trans yeah, predictive text, yeah. predictive translation, essentially. Um, and so what we're able to do there is um, reduce the cost of translation because um, it's, you know, kind of quasi machine translation. Um, we're able to put forth a lot more volume for that reason. Um, and also it's so much more, it's so much faster. It would take infinitely longer to translate all of these by hand. So we're able to lean on that efficiency of that technology. And then what happens is once we get that template back, it actually goes through a review process in which um, a tool that we've built gives us basically a side-by-side -side comparison of the English template and the now localized template. And we're able to do things like replace the fonts um, so that they support all the glyphs in, let's say, you know, Cyrillic, if we've translated something to Russian. Um, we're able to change out the imagery so that, you know, if you have a family around the table, perhaps we'll replace it with an Asian family. If it's, you know, a, a, a template that we're localizing for Japan. Um, do things like resize text boxes, all of these things that you kind of need the human uh, you know, language element and also just the human design eye to say, okay, this looks good now. And uh, we wouldn't really be able to do any of the process if we didn't have this kind of kind of one-two punch in yeah. a way, I think. Oh, no, it's very clever technology. And yeah. now, Eva mentioned you guys have over 100 languages or 100 languages. That, is that ever expanding? Is that always something that's in the works and you're looking to where you guys can... <laughs> no, um, probably at this point we'll stay with about, yeah, 100. It's I think 104 locales. It is. Um, we've definitely reached, I mean, there's literally thousands of languages in the yes. world. Um, and we're able to cater for, I think... 99% wow. of the world's <laughs> like internet users with the language spread that we have. Um, but never say never, you know, at mm -hmm. one point we actually had like a Australian um, kind of like Easter egg language Stryan. as well. Australian. <laughs> so instead of, you know, do you want to delete this? It's like, chuck it in the bin, you know, Cute. all of I those love things. So, People love that stuff. Yeah, we may have an Easter egg or two down the road. Somewhere. Oh, I think that's very clever. Well, and just on that, um, human interaction, we were talking a little bit about local content from local creators. Um, how, I mean, it, how far do you get local content to the world in terms mm. of when it comes to Canvas spread? Is it, is it localized or is it the sort of thing where you can, you're seeing people build things at home and it's going global? Is that the sort of thing? 
all of the above, yeah, to right. be honest. Um, the vast majority of our library at the moment is localized, so we've yeah. gone from English to other languages because that's where we started. Mm. Um, however, we've started uh, a creators program where basically um, folks who are in this creators program, they can create their own templates and put it to the Canva library for the public to use, and there's some sort of like kind of royalty scheme or something like that, so they're able to earn as well um, as, uh, you know, make content available for our users around the world and um, oftentimes these people will be in you know different markets and so that is also kind of improving the the hyper localization of our platform as well which plugging is everyone together and making sure they can like share and subscribe and get it all that's out there that's exactly right if people haven't um gotten involved with canva already yes what do you recommend they do what's the first step i understand you guys have a pro version or a premium as well mm. um, there's a free trial can you just take us through a little bit about that um, for those who might be going I need social media, I need, you know, banners, I need, like, what sort of things can we make on the platform? And again, this is yeah. just for people who may not know just yet. Sure, yeah, I mean, Canva is basically, you know, a visual communications tool, anything you want to make. Um, social media graphics usually are the first port of call. Um, you, we have, you know, the free version available as well, and then upgrading to the pro version, I think you get different access to different editing features, um, some more content as well, like, the, you know, different, um, design elements like illustrations or uh, photography, things like that. But there's a wide, wide content offering in the free version as well. And um, yeah, you know, people who are really active on Instagram or social media, people who use um, social media platforms to um, market their small businesses. We see a lot of small, medium business owners. Um, I use Canva the most for presentations. Um, oh, all, I, you know, I'm in work all the time doing decks for people and doing decks for, you know, my managers and, and basically, um, educating my colleagues about localization as well. So that's, I use it the most for presentations, which is really exciting. Um, and I've learned how to even rethink the way that I present based on, you know, what visual communication principles are in place. So. Now, see, isn't that interesting? You're actually learning how oh, to, yeah. you know, through Canva, you're actually learning how to change how you communicate with other humans. Yeah. This gets deep. Eva, are you a Canva user? Have yes, you tried absolutely. it? Look, we did a happy dance when Rachel said yes to coming because it's such an inspirational company and it's got, um, you know, social um, ethos behind all that they do. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for me personally, seeing things that are accessible and anybody can use right. um, is, is just inspirational. Um, and, you know, seeing the growth and also how um, Canva has reached into different communities. Um, and, you know, it's no longer uh, a challenge to put something together and it, it's very user friendly. So if anyone hasn't used it, go for it. Even I can use it. So that's, <laughs> that's saying something. Um, but, you know, just um, just seeing the commitment to communication yeah. and accessibility is just so refreshing and so unique, I think. And you, look, you know, most people want to buy in their own language. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't think of that as your uh, ethos in your company, then you're missing out on a very large chunk of um, you know market I guess so go for it and use Canva. So what kind of tools I guess have empowered content platforms to diversify and localize their offerings and help drive representation as well mm. just touching on this um, amongst historically less represented groups um, in this space? You see a lot of um, what we call machine translation, which is almost sometimes a, a naughty word to say in localization sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We've exactly. brought that one up before. But machine translation, there's absolutely a time and a place. And the way we see it most utilized is um, uh, when we're looking at things like corpuses of uh, content, like let's say imagery and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, we're able to basically localize tons of metadata in a much shorter amount of time um, in a way that is, you know, much more cost effective. And with that, we're able to then, you know, partner with more, um, let's say, local creators rather than just like the Gettys of the world, but people who are actually on the ground, you know, part of a community, and we can get that representation and then also be able to localize it quickly, efficiently, um, and basically, you know, help raise their exposure as creators, but then also making sure that our library is representative, you know, that we have localized content um, that is, um, diverse and yes, representative of, of minority groups who may not always be represented again in like the Getty collections of the world. Yeah. And as a communication tool, I think it's a really great way to right. bring people into the, you know, into the fold. But uh, I suppose my next and final question is what do you think the future of multilingual communication in the race to faster, cheaper and better business looks like from what you've seen and experienced in your work with Canva as well? I mean, the sky is the mm. limit, you know, um, but when we think in terms of, of Canva and in terms of 
design and again, you know, kind of this digital technology space. I'm thinking of localization in terms of things like um, text to speech um, and making sure that Canva is actually an audio visual platform and the way that people navigate Canva uh, might look different. You know, um, again, in certain communities, perhaps literacy rate is lower, digital literacy rate is lower. So if you have tools that are built within the product that help uh, people navigate it, like again, text to speech, things like this, uh, it automatically becomes more navigable for them and language isn't a barrier. It's almost counterintuitive. We don't want to do translation anymore. We just want it to be as seamless as possible and, and kind of work in things like AI and uh, other functionality that just makes Canva easy to use, no matter where you are, who you are, what language you speak. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I, I can, I guess I said it was quite intuitive for someone like myself, but you've raised an interesting point there that it could be, you know, not as intuitive for some other people. So there's always exactly. something to think about. But uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the forum today and having a discussion with us. Eva, as always, thanks for your time. Good to see you. Thank you so much again. Easy. Hello and welcome back. I'm your host, Mike Loder, and that was an exclusive interview for the Vic Forum 2022 with Rachel Carruthers, their head of internationalization and localization over at Canva. Now, a streamer has highlighted a powerful message within the comments that I thought I'd point out that uh, communication equals talking with people, not to people. I think that's a uh, interesting highlight, uh, the underlying theme of today's forum about communication on the whole. Okay, and now for something completely different. Let's face it, translation doesn't strike everyone as the most exciting topic. Not us here at today's forum, of course, but trust the team at Polaron to come up with a fun and exciting way to explain how translation works. Let's take a look at a little something that they prepared earlier. Is your job to communicate with diverse audiences? We know creating genuine community engagement can be challenging. Accurate language services are essential to producing better outcomes for our communities. Everyone should have access to messages in their preferred language. And be confident with information they receive. The team at Polarong can help you create and manage your organization's multicultural content. Choosing the right languages, formats and reach. Polaron is an award-winning language services provider with offices across the world. Since 2000, Australia's diverse communities have been at the heart of everything we do. If you need help with your multicultural communication, Polaron's free strategy session can help. Get in touch today. Call us on 1300-885-561 or email translations at polaron.com.au. Hello and welcome back to the Vic Forum 2022. Now, the language service industry has been undergoing transformation for some time, but what are some of the emerging trends that will shape the sector now and, of course, into the future? I am lucky enough to have a panel of distinguished guests with me to discuss these points. I have Anthony Pym, who is a professor of translation studies at the University of Melbourne. Next to Anthony there is Jin Han, professor at Western Sydney University as well. We've got Mark Painting, CEO of Nati, back in the studio. Welcome back. Next to him is Emiliano Zucchi, the CEO of the Ethnic Communities Council of Victoria. And remotely in television land, I have Marcus Mazuki, business unit manager at Polaron Language Services. How are you there? Very well, thank you. 
No worries. Now, currently Australia occupies less than 1% of the global market share of this industry, yet given our multicultural and linguistic diversity, we're very well placed as a language services hub. So what can we do to create opportunities for growth in this sector? Now, Mark, I'm going to start with you. You're in the hot seat. Talk us to a little bit about what Nati's seen um, and maybe we'll just generate a bit of discussion and talk about what you all think and what you've seen. Mm. Uh, thanks, Mike. And yes, it is uh, disappointing when you think about it that we occupy yeah. only 1% of that. The, the, interestingly, the uh, global spend on language services continues to increase. So um, one of the positions of strength NATI has, obviously, um, from NATI's perspective, mm. is, is in fact the NATI certification system, which is a good sign of standards and quality and is uh, recognised internationally as a uh, uh, high standard so it is something we can we can leverage off yeah we also have you know our multicultural communities and the fact that a relatively small population has so many languages it, that we do have a really strong base of that so one of the advantages I think the technology side can provide is that hub type of uh, approach where um, interpreters can be now anywhere and, and dialing in remotely to meetings uh, all over the world and, and various um, uh, interactions yeah. and with the global population and migration and, and lots of movement in the world, lots of refugees um, needing help and support, you know, we hope that there is some sort of opportunity for uh, interpreters, especially based in Australia, to, to perhaps be engaged in some of that work. Absolutely, and I think standards is the key that you've sort of said there, raising the standard, making sure everyone's got access to translations and communications tools that are of a high standard. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about education. Anthony, I'll bring you in um, as a professor of translation studies at the University of Melbourne. What have you seen in relation to how we can expand the growth of this sector um, and maybe make it a little more inviting for those who are sitting on the outside? We have tons of international students coming here for translation. Mm. So it's one of already in education, yeah. big export industry and, and our training in translation is at the highest level. Uh, but the problem is, not a problem, that we have to remember the, the, the task, our historical mission in Australia is to create the perfect multicultural, multilingual society. And NATI exists for that, many of our services. That's what we, that's our first mission. Mm. On top of that, the icing on the cake could and should be an expansion of international services. Mm. Problem, uh, at the high level, you're looking at niche markets for, uh, things that the machines can't do. We have automation. How do you react to automation? You do what the machine can't do. So you, we need people who, who have languages and a specialization in another area. Mm. And, and, and you work for those vertical sectors. I feel like we've seen so many different applications, you know, there's Duolingo and things like that you can use to learn languages on the go and things like that. Uh, it's machine translation. But that's, that's, that's yeah. the big revolution, <laughs> neural machine translation come to terms with that. Either you control the technology, we don't, yep. or you do what the machine can't do. And that's that's where we can go ahead. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Emiliana, do you agree with that statement? That uh, yes, look, I think the first thing to say is that we need interpreters. We need to continue to develop interpreters, professional interpreters, because mm -hmm. it's a great need in Australia. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's fundamental that governments continue to support and invest in language services. This is a, the base point uh, uh, to make. Uh, I agree with Anthony, uh, we, you know, we, we've got a, a, a great potential in Australia, mm. um, but somehow we need to improve how we teach languages. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I feel I want to be a little bit provocative, but I feel that for the most multicultural country in the world, we're not so good at teaching languages. And uh, most of the NATI certified interpreters are born overseas. Mm. We, it would be great to see more Australian-born professional professionally certified. Do you think that education should begin in, term, in schools, primary schools, I think schools, it should education. start at primary school. I think if we look at the Scandinavian countries where they learn multiple languages from a very early age, I think that that's the way to go. At the same time, I also agree with Anthony that technology, we need to work with technology, accept and embrace it, mm. and be the driver behind technology and not let technology mm. override us. Right, uh, right. Yes. So education, technology, <laughs> Jing, what have you seen um, up in Sydney with the work that you've been up to? Uh, well, more than Sydney, I suppose, but you know, all the main points have been covered by all three gentlemen. 
I do see the diversity, linguistic diversity in Australia is a very unique and a great advantage. I worked at SBS for 23 years. One thing I can tell you, any language program coming to Australia, we never fail to find a language speaker of that particular language. Really? It's, uh, it's amazing. So that's why we always do subtitle. We never do the dubbing because we have language speakers. But having said that, all the gentlemen have touched is one of the thing, uh, especially technology dri driving the changes. Speed is a thing. So much information these days, uh, yes. and so fast we have to turn around. Speed is a big challenge to translators, to interpreters, to language services, and including SBS. So technology would be the drive because only technology will make you faster. Mm. Uh, you know, we make deliver the services faster. So for Australian, the, the unique circumstances is this diversity. We all coming from source countries, you know, Spanish coming from various and Chinese mm -hmm. or Arabic. So we're all coming from source countries. So in that sense, we are smaller in terms of data storage or data banking uh, machine translation. So we do need to go back. It would be important to go back to link up with the source language country so that we can take advantage of the software that have been developed. Isn't that interesting? Software yes. developed by yes. different cultures for different people. That's right, that's right. Languages. Because they have a bigger data, you know, like it's Spain, Spain, it's all Spanish. So Spanish would be developed so much faster mm -hmm. than, in, than in Australia. So that's the advantage we, we should take. Anthony, did you? Yeah, I mean, we build up the databases for the smaller languages. That's, that's one of the things. I think one of the, the errors, though, is to think that the uh, cult communities, the uh, yeah. culturally linguistically diverse communities, speak the language, therefore they can translate at the highest level in that language. Mm -hmm. And that we tried many years ago with languages for export. We thought, oh, we'll export in the languages because they speak it. No. Yeah. <laughs> you Different. need not just high level of language, yeah. but knowledge of the field. Yeah. So this is going back to Emil Emiliano. You know, training in languages to the highest level is, is to get that professional uh, base on which you can build an industry. And, and I think, Bill, to what's happening, Anthony, is that um, we have excellent students going through the university system yeah. that learn languages at the highest level, but often do it for research purposes or literary purposes. They don't go into interpreting for the community. The people that go into interpreting with the communities are typically people born overseas that come here and then get another certification and then work as professional interpreters. So some of them might go into translation, but they might go into translation of literary texts or things like that. So we need to sort of bring those two together and say, no, we need the highest level of professionalism in community interpreting, uh, not just for academic purposes. We don't study languages at universities only for academic purposes, but also for community okay, purposes. But Emiliano, you have to pay them more. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, charge I mean, them less. Yeah. For literary, but uh, literary translation is even worse. Yeah. Right. Oh, right. No. But, I'd, uh, I'd actually yeah, like yeah. to bring in uh, Marcus Mazzocchi, yeah. who's out there at the moment. Marcus, you've been tuning in. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been thinking and what you think we maybe could be doing more based on your experience in uh, Polar on Language Services, obviously? All right. Thank you. That's a great question. So I can tell you a little bit what we have been doing in terms of you know technology services at. To, to shape um, the future of the, the language service industry. And uh, I can tell you on, on the technology and service offering front, uh, Mike, we have invested in our systems to facilitate the work that we do uh, and to produce high quality translations for our clients, obviously with you know the help of our linguists, which are also using um, you know the, the latest uh, tools and technologies out there uh, to support their work. Um, you know, I can tell you we're on the final stages of developing our interpreter now uh, platform which will allow users and users to quickly connect to NADI certified interpreters. So it doesn't matter which industry you are, uh, you know, if you're in aged care or, or hostels, you, you'll be able to use that platform if you want. And we've uh, developed that platform based on the principles of a social enterprise so that the majority of the fees collected will actually be going to the interpreters uh, to support the industry. Now, on, on the people and culture front, uh, you know, not, not really related to technology, but just to tell you a little bit what we're doing that, uh, you mm. know, we just want to bring our personal values um, uh, that, you know, to, to the workplace. We want a workplace to reflect that. So, you know, we, that, that means that we want to pay our linguists, you know, our, our translators, our interpreters, fair and decent rates. We want to provide an equal uh, opportunity in our organization. Uh, we continue to collaborate with the communities. and. 
uh, you know, these are just a few of the things that we're doing, and we really pride ourselves on, on being a, an ethical translation company with a solution-focused business model and a focus on creating a sustainable uh, industry for the next generation of uh, translators and interpreters. Yeah, it's an interesting thing there, and a few people have brought up the speed at which we need to uh, look at getting translations, but I, I'm concerned that with speed comes a lack of accuracy. Now, I understand that Nati actually provides a certification when it comes to being accurate. Have you got the speed as well? And how do you balance those two things without losing anything, I suppose, is my question. Mm. Yeah, like, like, well, like a, uh, with most things, uh, okay. s speed and cost and, um, <clears throat> and quality are all in interconnected. Um, I guess the, the machine aspect will increase the, the speed and the expectation, of course, of customers is always to do that. Um, and depending on the machine and the, and the language as, as how well it, we can do that. I guess what's important is um, good translators, of course, don't, you know, they don't fight with machines. They embrace it mm. and use, it, use the best technology and, and apply their skill then um, to, to quality to quality assure that output. Mm. Um, so that's the sort of... Uh, that's the balancing act that you guys work on. I, I was curious also if anyone would like to chime in to touch on the social expectation. Yeah. Um, more and more people are expecting inclusion and, and we're, you know, multicultural communities are in the spotlight more than ever before, thankfully, but it's still, I wouldn't say there. Jing, what do you yeah. think in terms of social expectation? I think social expectation in link with uh, technology because there's lots of a machine translation can do the machine translation, can do the translation so quickly on the spot. I think it's very important to, to differentiate the quality for different course, horses for courses, for example. Mm. If you're traveling and uh, you know uh, just where to go and what to eat, that accuracy is not, not going to kill you. But if it's a health information, that can be vital. So I think accuracy has definitely to be there. And the people, generally public, uh, they have a lot of allowances for machine translation. 80%, wow, that's really wonderful. But 80%, that means 20% inaccuracy, that could be really lethal. So I think it is very important public education as well. So machine can do a lot of things, but in the meantime, we need to be very conscious and uh, acknowledge mm. the accuracy is vital because accuracy is not linguistic but culture, culture sensitivity, culture safety. Mm. It's uh, so important to many people. Anthony, please chime in. Yeah, uh, look, we've been doing research um, over the past few months on obviously COVID information in the communities in Melbourne. And what we're finding is that a lot of communities themselves are doing translations or working from official translations and then adapting to the age group, obviously the elderly, and then media. Uh, a print text can become a telephone call or a community-based video. Uh, the written becomes spoken. Mm. And this is understood uh, and has behaved, has changed behavior in the communities. So in Australia, this is happening, even though we don't see it around. And it's not the strict translator. The translator is one link <coughs> In, in that communication. Isn't that interesting? Chain, I think yeah. the link is an interesting thing to point yeah. out now. And Emiliano, do you agree that, uh, should it be a link or a platform across the board? It just no, seems, I, I think is it all made, too separated? I, I think you made a very important point. We need to differentiate. If we're doing a translation for to apply, I don't know, for a driver's license, it's very different, yeah. diff different to giving consent to a procedure in hospital. Mm. So I would suggest that as much as possible in uh, uh, contexts where the risk is higher, such in health or courts in, in the legal system, we need to we need to facilitate the presence of face-to-face -face professionally certified NADI interpreters, uh, either face-to-face -face or by video. I will telephone is something different. I think we have the technology. Let's do uh, uh, let's do video. Regarding information during COVID, COVID has actually taught us a lot. Uh, but I would have liked, and the information was changing so quickly yeah. that by the time it was translated or passed on to the community, it was dated. Yeah. So I would have preferred to see an approach whereby if uh, the Premier is doing a PREF conference, why, just as we have Australian interpreters there, why couldn't we have not certified professional interpreters in different languages and you tune into the Arabic channel or the Italian <coughs> channel, the Greek channel, mm. and that why the information is live, consecutive, uh, and there is not that risk at, but that but that by the time it gets to the community, it's already aged. But there is that platform and expectation of, you know, providing, mm. do you all agree with that? Is that something that mm. is lacking, perhaps? Is that the right thing to say? There is something lacking when it comes to 
communication yeah. from our leaders, from our government? I we found lots of complaints yeah, right, yeah, from I the community. Th yeah, I think it backs to Anthony's previous point is people think it's, you speak the language and then you can translate Any person yes. translating language is translation, not necessarily. Mm. You know, there are so many gaps in there. Translation needs a lot of uh, knowledge and training, so it's not just the speak of language. So often people, including leaders, oh, is it translated into language? That, that's all done, job is done. Yeah. Yeah. What mm. was happening <coughs> in COVID though is that a lot of, uh, 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 a lot of the community were not going to Australian official channels for information on COVID, but they were going to channels of information that we could not ascertain. Social media. <coughs> Social media <coughs> or, you know, uh, TV television or radio. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. It's, it's, you know, we, what telephone message? We need, we need Australian information, Australian endorsed information delivered to deliver it to that high standard. And <coughs> if uh, if uh, citizens or residents were going to other channels, it means that something was lacking. We yeah. should have mm. been Ma doing something. Like Marcus, that. I'll just bring you back in. Uh, and from a business standpoint, there's obviously a lot to gain. We've discussed a lot of things today, but can you distill it down to some of the major benefits and things we can look to change when it comes to growth in this uh, sector as well? All right, thanks. That's, that's a good question, uh, Mike. So, uh, I think uh, I think we touched uh, on this a little bit. I think I think the uh, language service providers of today uh, are not going to be the same tomorrow. I think you know uh, technology is slowly um, will change that, and, and companies will have to adapt what they do. Uh, they will have to um, have a more uh, solution uh, folks focused uh, business model, and and they have to you know they'll have to adapt the products uh, that they serve. Um, to the clients, uh, uh, I, I think that's that, that's already happening, and that's going to continue to happen uh, moving forward. Yeah, I think adaptation is a, a very good word to use. So, just I guess in summary, we've talked about a lot of things today, mm -hmm. guys. So, I'm looking to get a little bit of a summary from each of you, just about what we could possibly do, and maybe some things we can improve on. Nobody's perfect, but we should try to improve. I'll start from this end, and we'll go around. What do we have to do? <laughs> tell us, tell us what we're doing. We're Summarize doing great the training. Today. We yeah. have a great certification accreditation system. Oh, we need professionals who have languages and other knowledge. Yeah. Legal knowledge in some cases, marketing knowledge, etc. And think of the time zones. We didn't mention that, but time zones yes. are really a big constraint. We can use it to our advantage or not. Just touch on that for me. I think that's an important one. Before well, we at the highest level, you need face-to-face -face communication to sell a, a, a really high-level product. Yep. And for interpreting, you don't want to be interpreting at 4 o'clock in the morning. Really, not, not on a long-term basis. Uh, so, you know, we look at, at, at our market in our time zone, Chinese, Japanese, Malaysian, Indonesian. We can uh, look at South America a bit as well. There's movement but, uh, to be had. But, yeah. Yeah. Jing, I'll go to you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we have an arty. It's one of the only thing or in the world which has been working really good. And also we have education, you know, translation uh, studies, education is one of the best in the world. I think to uh, move forward and uh, to push, you know, to put Australia in a, in a much better position would be the technology. Okay. I think embracing technology is vital for us. And again, you, you see some many places including universities, I see they're sending, uh, you know, um, communication and they said, oh, okay, click on Google for translation. What? <laughs> you know, so oh, that's an official, <laughs> some, sometimes they say. Often people say, oh, just to click on, give you the link to the Google translation, you Google Translate. Which, as we know, can be problematic. Um, mm. Very, very. <laughs> so I think, you know, but the machine translation or neuro machine translation is mm. the way to go to, for, the, for the speed, for the accuracy. Basically, it's a human train, training machine. So how much you train. And then on, on that point, I would like to encourage all the language specialists and language services or language organizations should participate actively with the technology development mm -hmm. unless you have your input otherwise they go without you and that would be the end that we are not part mm -hmm. of it which will be very well summed up by yes. you Jing. thank you mm -hmm. mark over to you yeah thanks mike and i think i th bring it back uh locally I, I guess one of the things i want to make sure that we that we don't do is is not learn a lot of lessons through the COVID experience really important, you know, very historic event, um, all happened so quickly and the tendency is to quickly move on. But the whole communication piece is so important and I think, um, and I think uh, someone mentioned before, you know, having a document in language and the translation and output and, and that's it. 
it's, that's now just one piece in the chain and we've now got to think about it rather than a translation thing as a communication project and it starts with the source text and making that you know often more digestible to begin with then the translation then the contextualizing it and or localizing it and for cultural purposes and all the rest of it and then sharing the community so um, Really I guess refined. we've got to think about that whole that as a process rather than a, a single transaction. Yeah. And I think we are one of the things that we learnt from COVID is that there was lots of issues with translation initially. I think there was too much emphasis on the translation bit, and because they often um, were criticised unfairly f because they were actually okay, but the con wasn't contextualised, right. localised for the audience or for the for the end, for the consumer, mm. whose literacy standards in their language might not have even understood, if it was translated perfectly, it still might not have been effective. Mm. So I think thinking about an effective communication process rather than just the translation. Um, so, you know, then we talk more about that trans transferring that information through community um, leaders and so forth, which is yeah. all fine as well. What I don't want to see is that type of model replacing an official you know s certified professional translator but it complementing it mm. so you still get focus on the initial message right a good professional translation and then contextualizing it to suit the audience it truly should so be a about symbiotic a, yeah. a symbiotic relationship yeah. in that yeah. emiliano we'll finish well, with you picking up from where uh, mark we'll left off i mark. think uh, we're, we're all on the uh, um, on the same page um, However, I also think we should ask to consult with the communities. What does the community want? Mm -hmm. We are experts in a way, so we see it from, uh, from our, uh, I suppose, educated uh, or um, uh, informed academic research. Um, but what does the, con the community want? What is the preferred way by the community? So I think perhaps we should consult with them to see how to best pass on information to them. Talk with, not to. Okay, Marcus? out there in television land, do you want to just uh, give us your wrap and summary from today's project? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So in terms of technology, I think, look, I think, um, you know, it's it's great. We need to adapt. We need to use this technology. But if you take machine translation, for example, we, we're not really there yet in terms of uh, new and emerging languages that we have a lot in Australia. Um, so I think we need to continue, uh, you know, as we mentioned uh, before, education of uh, individuals from new and emerging uh, communities so that can, you know, they can have that uh, NADI certification and we, you know, uh, for government organizations, we've done a lot of translations uh, for COVID related material for new and emerging languages. So I, I think it's important to continue that education so we can, uh, you know, have uh, NADI certified translators in those languages um, for the community. Yeah. Very well spoken. Now I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us on today's Big Forum. It's incredible. I feel like I've learned something and that's one of the, my favorite things about working with Polaron. So it's always fun to have these discussions. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and uh, input. Thank now you. for something a little different. I was lucky enough to speak with a dancer from Bollywood who shared some exciting ideas about their dance school and experience with Bollywood dancing. To take a listen. Shweta Pandya is a performer of Bollywood dance and is the founder and director of ABC Dance, which stands for Anybody Can Dance. It's a Bollywood dance school and it's my pleasure to welcome the bright and shining Shweta Padya to the studio. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I guess I want to talk to you first about what inspired you to get involved in dance. It's obviously, Bollywood is obviously such an incredible space to be in. Talk to us about what inspires you when you're dancing. Okay. So when, when I come to Australia, I, I've, I've, I've been struggling to well, you know, find a dance school where I can you know, um, manage or dance somewhere with the Indian dancing. Mm. So when I thought, you know, okay, if I don't find anything else, let me just open it about my, uh, by myself. I've been a professional dancer learning since almost 20 years now. Wow. So I thought, okay, let's just start something new and let's give the Indian community or, and Bollywood is very famous in everywhere in the world now. So I thought, okay, let's start with some slowly and gradually. So and when I came here, I started with the classes with a small amount of the kids and um, thought to just pass, pass on them that culture, the Bollywood dancing, the colors, the enjoyment, you know, the happy faces and things like that. What is it about Bollywood dance that you think is so inspiring and exciting? You know, when you came in today, I said that my face just lit up um, and smiled. Can you talk to us a bit about that? 
Sure. Uh, see, Bollywood dancing is, is, you know, as you can see, I'm wearing a very bright color, right? So it's, it's more about the colors, more the, you know, the enjoyment, the smiles. Whenever, you know, the music starts from the beat, you know, you just get very excited and, and it's, it's a natural smile you're going to uh, dance throughout the, mm. you know, the journey, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's something very authentic about it. So I Thanks. guess we believe that music and dance is a very important aspect when it comes to cultural um, connection and bringing people together. How does your dance school, ABC Dance, um, create a vibrant and energetic atmosphere for the students, I suppose? How do you teach, you know, do you in integrate your learnings and share them with the students in some sort of unique way? Yes, we do. Actually, as you know, that ABCD stand for anybody can dance, right? So in my school, we have all the students. I mean, we cater from year um, age three years to seventy-five year old. Yes, I have many special kids where they require. I had I done because of the them. I learn a lot of skills. I go outside if there is a diabetic. I go out and educate myself that how to handle them if there is a autism are there we I go out and learn about them that okay how to handle them in the class so yes so we cater from uh, eight, three years old to 75 years all have all the people have different age group wise classes and uh, you know for me giving them happiness giving them uh, you know culture as, as well as you know do different activities to them and uh, provide them this uh, activity to come out from the home rather than you know send, uh, sitting on the gadgets things like that yes we know what children are like when it comes to iPads I'm quite guilty sometimes myself oh, yes. but uh, no I think that's incredible that you actually go out and learn about your students and how you can actually get to them and reach them I think that speaks okay. very highly of you as a teacher now I understand we have a performance of yours that we would like to show and yes. Shweta I'd like to thank you so much for joining me in the studio today and uh, thank you so much for having me of course. pleasure now, let's take a look at that performance. Okay.
Hello and welcome back to Vic Forum 2022. Now, Aristotle once said it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Debating offers this very opportunity to challenge your thinking and question your views. We have assembled a distinguished panel of experts to discuss the debate statement, technology will be humanity's downfall. I'll be taking up the role of moderator for today's debate and do you agree with this statement? There are many factors to consider here with the rise of the internet and the expansive options we have when it comes to technological choice, devices we once imagined to have now come to existence and then some. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the affirmative team for today's debate, founder of Ticker News, the generous host location of our forum today. I have Charles Tan, I have Aaron Young, I should say. <laughs> Over in television land, I've got Charles Tan, Magistrate to the Magistrates Court of Victoria. Welcome to the program. And Thank of you. course, we have Nikki Long, CEO of Expression Australia. Welcome to you. I would now like to express my welcome to the negative team. Dominic Carter, a Director of Polar on Language Services. Welcome to you. Thank you. Out there in television land, we have Irfan Deliri, CEO of Kind Enterprises. Welcome to the program. Thank you. And Saadi Ali, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Now, our team captains will have five minutes to speak respectively, with our other members allocated four minutes to express their points. I will be keeping tabs on this, so concise and pointed remarks will be the name of the game. Starting off today, Aaron Young, I would like you to jump right in. Of course. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, nice to hear you describe me as distinguished for once. That's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, appreciate it. And welcome to everybody, of course. Great to have you here at Ticker. Um, I want to start off saying I never thought I'd be on the affirmative side. Everyone had a bit of a laugh when they heard that. After all, I've always been part of the tech generation and pretty proud of that. The first to get a mobile phone at school, the first to get an iPad lining up in New York when it first came out all those years ago, uh, the first Australian to do so, and of course, here we are in a very high-tech television studio. But that also gives me a bit of an understanding of the other side of these things as well. Um, while we talk an O oh, of debt of gratitude to all the people who came up with this innovation, we found out that there are some key problems with technology along the way. So today I want to focus on three key points being communication, connectivity, and also uh, romance as well. So we'll start off with the first one about connection and connectivity, of course. Technology uh, revolutionizing the way people communicate right around the world. But the truth is connection and technology have really failed to deliver what it set out to actually achieve. So think of how we've all behaved over the last few years. At first, it felt like a bit of a break from the rat race, right? Thanks to our computers at home, we'd be able to carry on working. But now it's become an omnipresent distraction for all of us. We never get to switch off. It was meant to be eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and eight hours of play. Now it's eight hours on a device at work, eight hours on a device for play, and I sleep next to my phone, which wakes me up if there's something urgent I need to know about. That obviously has a whole bunch of side effects. It brings us anxiety to otherwise normal people who wouldn't have that anxiety, and it raises those levels, and the notifications, as we know, never go away. Then there's the really dark side where the trolls hang out. Of course, would they say that to your face? But it's so easy to say it in a dark room connected to a computer. Even CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, is encouraging us all and the younger generation to get outside, to go and meet people at university. That's how Facebook began. Now people are just meeting on the internet, but not actually meeting in real life. The AFL CEO recently said that the biggest concern for them is trying to get kids away from games like Fortnite and out kicking a ball mm. once again. So let's talk about collaboration. Think about how things first started, how we worked. Before the pandemic, we all went to one place, to one location. We built communities. We got to meet people that we otherwise may not get to meet. We changed ourselves. It was a fantastic way to work. Then, of course, at first, the promise from working at home was fantastic. It was tremendous. If you had began working on a project in an office, you could keep working on that project at home. But over time, we noticed that there were no new projects starting, and in fact, people started to slack off, you might say. Productivity has gone down, that is something we know. So uh, that project began, now people are trapped at their screens, they're stuck behind them. There's not a barrier anymore before between leaving the office and going home. It's now work, work, what? 
work all the time. We became larger, of course, sitting at screens rather than doing that exercise on our way to work and on our way home again as well. Uh, and at first, the experts predicted that there'd be an end of business travel. That hasn't happened. People actually can't wait to do business with each other once again. Of course, shaking hands and doing business other than doing Zoom and saying, is your mic on? I can't quite hear you at the beginning. Why? Because it's in our human nature. Let's talk again about companies like Peloton and Netflix, huge COVID stocks that slumped as soon as people could get away from them and go back outside, go to restaurants and to cafes and to actually get to meet each other as well. Let's talk about love, my final point, because love, what's more human than love? Well, dating apps promise so much, right? The idea that uh, we would get off the apps once we met someone. No one's getting off the apps anymore. That's where we've gone to. It's ended that human feeling, that joy of meeting people. It's taken away the, the, the organic nature and now we have these never-ending conversations. People aren't actually meeting. Uh, more choice doesn't make us happier, we have now learned as well. And the point that the objective of finding a partner is now merely a game. So technology making people commodities, impacting our sleep and our physical health. One minute. So in conclusion, technology never stops. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. We're being told that there'll be thousands of people who lose their jobs because of AI, particularly in the banking sector. What are these people going to do? What will their purpose be? We have to stop optimizing our computers and start optimizing our humans. There's a quote from Albert Einstein that I love. It says, it's become tragically obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. But an Apple CEO, the man in front of the biggest tech company in the world, of course, was the point uh, that he said, we need to focus on the misfits. We need to focus on the crazy ones and the ones who see things differently. Let's not let the cloud take away the things that make us human. Mike? Well spoken there, Aaron Young. I'm going to take it over to Dominic Carter to <coughs> okay. the opening statement for the negative team. Thank you. Okay, so speaking for the negative team, and I ironically would have preferred to be on your side and you on my side, so this is quite interesting. Um, I'm thinking of technology in the broader sense, uh, in the sense of uh, machinery and equipment that's developed uh, for the application, from the application of scientific knowledge and how that's been received over time. And we sit, as we sit on the cusp of major, major developments in, let's say, AI and, and computing and things like that, there is a, a certain amount of fear that, that, that will lead to the effective downfall of mankind. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I'll, I'll approach some of the points Aaron made as well uh, while we're at it. But briefly, our position is that technology won't be the downfall of mankind. It will be uh, for humankind. So it's... It's humankind that's going to be the downfall of humankind. Technology is, is it's how, how, how humanity uses it that's going, to, that's going to lead to the downfall, if there, there is a downfall. So technology over, over the eons of time has um, been synonymous with progress, from fire a million years ago to AI nowadays with gene editing. That's quite a topical one at the moment. But, you know, where would our lives be without computers, without steam engines, without all sorts of things? Um, and it's not always been well received. So <clears throat> when trains came out during the first journey by train, people thought the human body was, wasn't made to travel that fast uh, and that people would literally melt or that women's uteruses would come flying out. Like they had, they, they just projected these bizarre fears of the unknown. Uh, when Wi-Fi came out, we thought we would all die of cancer with all these waves flying around. Um, there's all sorts of things. Or remember Y2K in 2000. And that was just a little patch that we uploaded so that planes didn't fall over our heads. Um, so this goes again to its technology, it's, it's how we use it, really, than, than the technology I itself. Um, so on, you know, vaccines are technology as well. That's quite a topical one. Uh, is it a downfall of mankind to get vaccinated or not? Um, anyway, I could, I could give you a thousand examples, but I think we have less time than usual. So uh, some reasons uh, to uh, have prejudice for technology. So you've mentioned a few, and those are very real for us in terms of, of recent uh, pandemic uh, that's changed the way we live uh, in many ways, and we're all struggling to get back to some sort of degree of normality. Uh, but I would argue that, you know, the point about, you know, never switching off, uh, finding it hard to get our kids to go outdoors and, and love is, again, the use of technology rather than the technology itself. It's not dictating what we do. It's how we use it that dictates it. 
Crikey. Okay, uh, one minute. Uh, I did not. Did I speak for three minutes? Okay. Uh, so, uh, destructive technology has given technology a bad name, how we use, uh, we use bombs and so on and so forth. Generally, these come from positive um, research, but negative applications. I'm now speaking very schematically. Um, and then um, technology historically has also been released maybe uh, too soon. Mm. So, um, you know, it took a while to put brakes on cars. But nowadays, I think they've, they've, it's, it, the barrier to, to releasing something is much higher. Occupational health and safety is higher. And I will conclude then that we project our fears uh, onto, um, onto new technology. And new technology is, is on the cusp of making our lives very different again. Think of, there was a far side uh, picture comic and it had um, a prehistoric man looking to the sky and seeing a UFO. And that UFO was made of bones, stones and, and mammoth hide. Some interesting uh, outlines there, Dominic. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to go to Charles Tan, who is for the affirmative team, to present his points there. Thank you very much. Um, the first speaker for the affirmative um, side, Mr. Young, I think, um, spelled it out um, very, very well. When I looked at um, this um, issue and this topic, um, the statement's not about whether or not there's, uh, or whether or not technology is good or bad, or whether or not there's more positives of technology than there are negatives. What the question says um, is how does technology sit alongside humanity? And I guess the first question then is to ask, well, what is humanity? And humanity is the human race. It's a word that refers to the qualities that um, makes us human, the ability to love that um, Aaron spoke about, to have um, compassion, to be able to be creative. Humans have emotions, they have faults, they have vulnerabilities, limitations, and they do things imperfectly and incorrectly. It's why humans rely on one another, um, why we connect with other humans and why uh, for our advancement, our happiness, that um, we need that human interaction. So then how did technology arose, um, arise? It arose because um, it was perceived that there was a shortcoming in humans. Technology allows us to do things uh, more easily, more accurately than what humans can. Technology is austere, it's sterile, and it has no uh, emotions or feelings. So when you look at it, what technology um, does is that it doesn't seek to promote the qualities that makes us human. It actually seeks to work against it. Um, the greater the use of technology, the greater erosion um, of what it means to be human. And to the issue about the fact that it's not technology that, that's the problem, it's actually the humans that are the problem because it's how we use it. Well, what's the point of having technology if you don't deploy the use of technology or what is actually intended to you um, to do? Um, I've obviously coming One from minute, um, the inside of a courtroom as a magistrate. Um, what you do see in the courtroom is humanity. You see yeah. the negative side of it um, in terms of conflict and disagreement between people, but you also see the positive sides as well in terms of um, people and strength in the fact of uh, adversity and trauma. And whilst we're on the issue of um, language services and the use of technology, what often we see in the courtroom, of course, is um, interpreters, human seconds. beings um, performing a very, very important um, service. And the notion that um, greater advancement in technology, potentially the use of um, artificial intelligence, um, is concerning to me because whilst it might um, produce um, greater accuracy, in the interpreting um, of evidence. What I think it fails to um, show um, or highlight, the importance of interpreter is not just about the quality of the evidence or the accuracy of it, but also the fact that interpreters play an important role in supporting a witness. Charles, I'm gonna a witness have to leave it there. That's time. Thank you so much for your insights on that one there. Order, please. <laughs> now we'll go to Sadia Ali who will bring her negative uh, 
side of the argument, please. Thank you, Mark. But I would say that rather than having a negative uh, uh, in our team, I would rather be called as opposing team. Mm -hmm. And because we are here to discuss about the positivity and about the outcomes of technology. And I see that, you know, it's a very interesting uh, topic saying that technology will be the, the downfall of humanity. And I say that no, technology will not be the uh, downfall of humanity if and only if it is uh, Putting, uh, I'm looking at from the uh, you know cultural lenses that I've come from, and working with the diverse community groups, and uh, working with the people who have uh, you know who seek asylum, and work uh, working with people from migrant uh, you know background, uh, I see that technology has helped a lot. And this is uh, when technology is designed and co-designed and tested with. Uh, with the support of the community, then I think that technology has done miracles and technology has been, uh, you know, has um, been proved very positive and the outcomes have been recognized worldwide. And it's about just bringing a good balance between human and technology. Uh, it's a, it's, I say that, you know, the way COVID, the pandemic has brought us together in terms of you know, looking from the man management of the emergency management uh, or uh, from the perspective of uh, emergency point of view, how we have managed to you know, reach out to our loved ones, how we managed to come together, how we managed to, to have that communication and especially the work of the uh, language services that was recognized during this pandemic and the researches and the vaccination that came into you know, uh, effect Due to technology, we can we can never keep our eyes shut of how technology has been so uh, so miraculous and so helpful for the humanity. We we can't deny the fact that human are important, and as as long as we are using technology one as one of the tools, that should be fine. And losing that imbalance, you know, uh, losing that balance is always a downfall. I see that you know a balance, a good balance between the two is always a good side, a positive side of the uh, of the um, you know development, and it has always been uh, capacity or the power of human when we have worked together with the technology. I'm not a futurist, but I see that when technology is in good hands, it has always proven uh, you know the best. For example. Uh, you know, uh, we have come across the communication and we have become globally, you know, connected with each, with each other. For example, the Ukraine news, we would have never come to know about, you know, the, the Ukraine and people from war-torn countries if we had no technology. So I say that if the technology is in good hands, the humanity, th this is never going to be the downfall of the humanity. Thank Wonderful you. Wonderful points from you there, yeah. 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 All right, jumping over to Nikki Long for the affirmative. Please present your argument. Thank you for having me today and thank you very much for Aaron hosting this and Polaron uh, supporting us in being here today. Well, we began with some quotes. Albert Einstein uh, said, I fear the day when the technology overlaps with our humanity. The world will only have a generation of idiots. Well, why did he say that? It's because human beings are complex. Human beings are not unilateral, they are not unidimensional, and they are not certainly automated, streamlined, predictable, or all about making things more effective. We heard today about the importance of what it means to be human. It's about communication, connection. It's about love. Fundamentally, all humans want to be loved, and we don't believe that technology can achieve that. It is the downfall of humanity. Uh, it, yes, we heard from our opposing team, not our negative team, <laughs> about the fact that uh, humans are the problem, not technology. Well, I'm afraid to say that I think we can understand humans invented technology. They invented technology without thinking about the risks, without thinking about uh, the legalities without thinking about the fact that the impact on our environment and things around us. There is plenty of evidence today that has been presented in and around why technology is the downfall of humanity across our ability to work, our ability to connect, our ability to find a partner, a relationship, a friendship. 
these are the things that are about a sustainable human race. And the connectivity between all of us is vital. I think we can say safely that while we're all accessing you today and you accessing us um, through technology, we would all much prefer to take the time to be together, to be side by side like Aaron and I today. And um, I'm so, it's been so wonderful to have Magistrate Charles Tan with us. One minute. But how much I would much prefer to have Charles here in studio with us so that we can act as a team, we can get a sense of one another and post this debate today. We can have a coffee network and possibly even form a collaboration. So there is no doubt in our minds that technology is the downfall of humanity because we need communication, connection and collaboration. And without it, simply technology will not offer any benefits at all. Incredible words. Well said. Yeah, well said. All right, Irfan Deliri out there in television land, can you bring us home with the opposing argument and summarise? I certainly can. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, my colleague Charles Tan. Thank you so much. Even though you're from the affirmative team, you helped us prove our point in that technology is in fact inert and doesn't have its own intentions or qualities. Rather, it is an inanimate uh, object that uh, amplifies human beings and their intention. You see, friends, from the beginning of time, there have always been naysayers who have feared technology and tried their best to hold back the progress of humanity. Um, and there have always been those capable of finding the negative in anything and everything. I think the question wasn't, does technology have shortcomings and downfalls, but rather, will it be the downfall of humanity? And you can all imagine with me, even when the first fire was harnessed and the first flame was lit, there would have been someone there who said, this technology is going to be the downfall of humanity. When the first wheel was being crafted, there would have been someone standing over the shoulder of that craft saying, this technology is going to bring the downfall of humanity. And even when electricity was discovered and being commercialized to power our cities, there were fear mongers who were screaming at the top of their lungs saying, this technology is going to be the downfall of humanity. And again, they were wrong. They even drew posters and plastered them on the streets, showing people tangled in wires, being electrocuted to death in the streets in an attempt impede the rollout of that technology. At every new development and discovery, there, there have always been those who have been hesitant, resistant, or outright opposed to the latest innovation and the potential challenges and changes that it will bring with it. And yet, each and every one of these developments have allowed us to evolve, progress, and reach further towards our full potential as human beings. And each has also had the capacity to cause harm when weaponized by those with ill intention. Fire allowed us to warm ourselves and cook our food and to write poetry by candlelight. But it also allowed certain nations to launch cannonballs at other nations and colonize their land. The combustion engine allowed us to transport goods and ourselves around our cities and the world and make our planet home all that much more connected and closer. But it also caused congestion in cities, traffic accidents, and a global economy built on the burning of the fossil fuel crude oil. And now the internet. And the devices that we have and hold in our hands allow One us minute. to learn and gain knowledge at an ever-increasing rate, making each generation ever more capable of seeing and knowing and learning more than the previous generation. We can communicate across languages with interpreting apps. We can video call our family when we're locked down in our homes. We can live stream news from citizen journalists at the front line of conflicts and famines. And we can now self-publish books, albums, media, and digital art, democratizing the means of creation and distribution of the arts, literature, and news and media. The suggestion that technology will bring the downfall of humanity could not be further from the truth. It's not only this unsubstantiated, but it's been proven wrong every time. History has shown us the exact opposite. 20 seconds. Technology has allowed us to inform and evolve ourselves beyond the wildest dreams. Our dear friends on the affirmative team would have you believe that technology is to blame for the problems of society. But I put it to you that it's perhaps not the technology that will bring the downfall, but our lack of humanity as human beings that will bring the downfall. And perhaps well instead of Thank blaming you so the much. Tools, I'm going to have to cut you, you off there. Heart. Going to have to cut you off there. Well presented from you. Now, I'd like to take a moment to get each of the team captains to summarise and finalise their arguments from today's debate. I'm wondering where you're sitting out there in the audience, but I'll start with Aaron Young. Please summarise. 
Thanks, Mike. And uh, I think we've all learned a lot from what everybody has said. I've certainly learned and, and listened to uh, the other point as well from the opposing team. Um, but I want to talk about how this has had a massive impact on people. And we talk about how technology is on our side. I've watched Facebook and Google in my own industry swallow up 80% of the advertising industry and close down newspapers that are the beating heart of uh, local communities. We don't talk about that when it comes to technology, of course, because while things change, unfortunately, our capitalist society looks to towards technology to fix problems without thinking about people. And that is the clear point that we are talking about here. We might talk about how bombs were meant to stop people, but now they're being used. There'd be no war in Ukraine if it wasn't for the technology where someone could sit thousands of miles away and hit a button. We're able to do things without actually thinking about what we're actually doing. We talk about cars. Well, yeah, cars are great to get around, but we also have thousands of people who lose their lives because of it. We turn towards automation. And yet people are still dying from automated vehicles that aren't doing what they were promising. And here's a key question. Would any of us get on an aircraft that wasn't flown by a human? A key piece of technology. We know uh, that even in recent times, the news of the past 48 hours could be hu humans cause most of the issues with these things, but technology in the end is the way the, the carriage system for it to actually occur. So while we talk about things like guns and weapons, and that perhaps uh, the idea is that it's not the gun, it's the human involved. Well, they wouldn't do it without the gun. And technology certainly has given us weapons to be able to end humanity. Some heated summary uh, arguments there from Aaron Young. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to turn to Dominic to summarise. Okay, frantically writing notes. Um, well done. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> I lost my ear bit. Okay, so the main argument, our contention remains uh, untouched really and it is that it's 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 the people using the technology that that are the danger not the technology I itself um all the arguments that, that we've heard are, are about you know can be solved with proper usage or, or regulation um cars people die in, in car accidents because people don't drive responsibly necessarily it's not so much the car in fact a lot of work has been done to make cars much safer uh, planes as well much safer. I, I don't know about planes without a pilot quite yet uh, but, but you know when the technology is there and te tried and tested but the first people who got on planes uh, had a 200 percent higher chance of, of uh, no 200 times more likely to die than 60 years later when planes were still crashing because of turbulence uh, but nowadays you've got zero chance of dying on a statistically it's, it's, it's extremely low why? Because every time a plane crashes, they learn from it and they make sure it doesn't happen again for that reason. Um, the point uh, that was made, the Einstein quote I quite enjoyed, uh, that, that, that humans would, would become idiots. Uh, I think that says that just Einstein is worried about humans being idiots more than the technology itself, I, I would argue. Um, and uh, again, um, Nothing is going to be the downfall of humanity other than humanity itself and how it uses its technology. Well summarised, Dominic. Thank you so much. You. All right. Now, we will be back after a short interview that I managed to capture earlier with the judges presenting their results. Let's take a moment to speak to one of the major contributors for the event today. I was lucky enough to speak with Cultural Diversity, about Cultural Diversity Week, I should say, and what we can all look forward to with Polaron director Eva Hussein. Take a listen. We'll be right back. It's my pleasure to be joined in the studio by Eva Hussein, the director of Polaron Language Services. Eva, thank you so much. And well, thank you for bringing Vic Forum to life this year. It's obviously been an incredible program so far. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Cultural Diversity Week and where translation sits between, I guess, all of the other events that are going on. It's a celebration of food, art, culture, um, et cetera. So can you talk to us a little bit about how Polaron's managing to expand their reach and uh, weave their way into the celebrations as well. Mike, language is such a great connector um, and uh, being able to express yourself in your preferred language is such an important thing to communication to how we all fit into society I guess. So uh, a lot of our work has been focused on that, on working with communities to develop information um, that's useful, um, accessible and, uh, and also easy to understand. Um, throughout today um, we've been speaking of that very thing that um, you know we all want to be able to communicate, we all want to be able to connect. With the pandemic taking you know two years out of our lives, yeah. uh, we're finally back with face-to-face -face events and um, 
you know, discussions around language. So um, at Polaron, we do um, look at language as a connector, as I said, and how we can maximize, um, you know, the ability for people to communicate. So being part of uh, the Cultural Diversity Week every year is something that we've done for seven years. It's our seventh event. Congratulations. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And we try and put um, uh, forward um, issues that are relevant to, to the community. Uh, to how we um, are talking about language and language services. So this year we're talking about the future of translation um, industry of um, you know translation market and it's a very important conversation to have because I think we in Australia here we do a lot of translations but are they hitting the mark? Are they relevant to people? And how do you use technology to back up humans, uh, support them in the effort of communicating? Especially during what we saw in the last two years, um, Polaron's obviously been helping people uh, understand you know, things within medicine, within uh, general, you know, day-to-day -day living. Um, it's a very important part of what you guys do. So it's obviously an exciting week. There's a lot going on. Will you guys be attending, celebrating, looking to get involved in any other way, shape or form other than the generous Vic Forum that you guys have put on um, for everyone today? Mike, all of the above. Uh, we always out there in the community and I personally I'm just very pleased to be able to speak with people face to face because that's where yeah. most of my learning and connections happen. Um, this event is online um, and that is uh, one way, accessible way of people uh, from all over Australia, all over the world actually, um, to hear what we have to say and I think you know we do need to stay ahead of the game in, in this industry and see where we're going like we don't have a crystal ball but we we, we do try and um, predict some of the trends and talk about them um, in a way that's useful to translators interpreters but also clients who want to use our services and that that is where we come in with all this knowledge and um, hopefully people have learned a lot today i know i have yeah, definitely. And I understand that with the theme being technology, it's interesting to think that perhaps technology underpins everything else uh, you and I have discussed in the past when it comes to art, cultural diversity, uh, obviously translations. We see things like Google Translate, yeah. getting it right and all of that. Do you agree that technology seems to sit as a blanket when it comes to, you know, and it is very relevant? For our forum this year. Yeah, yeah. And look, there are also, um, in addition to what you've said, ethical considerations mm. of how and where technology comes in and how can we use it to the betterment of society, of, of the human race. And I think that that is the way I see uh, technology supporters. Um, we just need to make it accessible so that everybody across the board can use it and, um, you know, just use it. Um, in places and spaces that are of benefit to society uh, rather than become an impediment. I mean, you know, uh, every now and then you get a glitch uh, where technology doesn't quite work. Yes. So I think we're trying to iron um, all these things out and make it for a better experience for humans because um, that's what this is all about, I think. Is it fair to say we've got a little ways to go before we get there? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's not an interconnected uh, space as yet. And I think there's a lot more work that we need to be doing to um, making it more integrated and user friendly and accessible. Uh, but I think it's a massive learning curve, Mike. Um, it's been a massive learning curve of, of the last two years. And I think whatever learnings we're going to take away from the pandemic, uh, hopefully it'll um, make society better. I, I know it's a bit of a naive, uh, or maybe optimistic way of looking at things, but I, I'm a you know, eternal uh, optimist. Absolutely. So I'm hoping that by having these conversations, we can um, improve things and iron this kinks out that you've spoken. And of about. course, education is a big part of what Polar Run does. All right, well, thank you for checking in with me and uh, let's get right back into it. Hello and welcome back to the Vic Forum 2022. Now we've just had our great debate which uh, was quite interesting. Eva Hussein joins me in the studio. What did you make of the debate just quickly? It was very interesting. Mm. And um, as you can see, we've got trophies um, for uh, the winning team. And with the judges, um, we had a very robust discussion um, and we do have the results. Well, let's introduce the judges just quickly. I've got Aaron back into the studio and Rachel as well, who you've seen in the program earlier. And we also have Rina Rana, the founder of India of uh, India Women in Australia, I should say, to help us judge today's debate. Thank you all for coming on the program. And uh, you've all been eagerly sitting there unpacking the arguments. So I'm gonna leave it to Eva to announce who has won our great debate for this year. And uh, Eva, over to you. 
Drum roll. Um, so again, we had differences of opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard lots of um, diverse views and arguments that were put forward um, really well. But the winning team is the negative team and here are the trophies. Um, so well done everyone. Humanity um, is the biggest risk to humanity is what I take away from, um, from, from the space. discussion, from the debate. Uh, but all the points made uh, were very interesting and I think lots of learning, lots of uh, things to think about. Um, worth re-watching those of you that haven't seen it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, just to summarise, I guess, today, Eva, and thank you to our judges for coming on the program and uh, sharing Pleasure. your insight and laying your judgement down upon our great <laughs> debate team. It's wonderful to have you. Thanks, Mark. All right, Eva, let's summarise today's big forum. It's been an absolute run up for us to get this going. So I want to thank you for joining us and put, helping us put it all together. You and the team behind the scenes have been working nonstop, um, as well as us getting it all together. So to summarise, there's a lot to summarise. Yes, but well, thank you for being the best host in the world, Mike. Um, we do not have a trophy for you, but we're still very grateful. <laughs> and um, you're absolutely right. To put an event like this uh, together of really high quality content is not easy. But we did try today and look, discussions were, um, I felt quite innovative and, um, um, you know, we didn't necessarily argue, but, you know, there was robust um, conversations. Debated. The page, that's the word I was looking for. Um, and I just think um, that having conversations like this is super important um, to how the industry is developing. We had a few um, heavy duty experts uh, that had a lot to say and uh, it was really good to have everybody in the same room, I guess. Um, although most people have watched it online, I am um, very pleased and I wanted to thank you, the team at TICA, uh, everybody that's come along, um, some people from pretty far, uh, like Sydney. Um, and um, and also my team at Polaron who has um, thought of everything uh, for the day. I think it was a great event and mm. thank you again. No, no worries at all. And thank you to all of you out there for watching and tuning in. I saw you were all very active uh, on the stream earlier. So this was the Vic Forum 2022 Beyond Translations. We explored the future of the language services industry. I hope you learned something. I know I certainly did. And I hope you enjoyed this celebration of the hard work and determination demonstrated by our guests and of course all the behind the scenes people which I mentioned earlier as well. I want you all to have a wonderful rest of the day. I'm your host Mike Loder. Be well and stay safe out there.